is setting up the meeting for live. Yay, technology. Ooh. Christopher, how are you from the UK, man? You hanging in there? I'm doing all right. It's been a long week. Oh. Hey, I think we are live. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, um, I have a little notification. All right. So welcome to Cleveland Opera Theater Series, Page to Stage. Uh, in this series, we are uh, sitting down with a, a different member of the design team, the creative team, or a part of the team that brings a production literally from the page to the stage. Uh, we, we started with our uh, resident uh, technical director and scenic designer, Matt Kieran. Uh, last week, we had uh, our projection designer, Brittany Miranda, with us. And this week, we have Steve Shack, who is our lighting designer. So we're super excited to have you with us here, Steve. And bear with us. If something goes wrong and all the technology crashes, uh, we'll reboot again. Uh, but Steve, I've been starting off just asking uh, each, each artist just to talk about what it is that you do. So just nuts and bolts, what is a lighting designer? What do you do? I create the entire atmosphere, well, a big part of the atmosphere for the show, basically. And um, I take into account location, time of day, emotional vibe, what's going on in the show, and create a light plot that allows me the instruments and tools to create an, an environment that reflects all of those things. Nice. That's, yeah. That's um, so you, you mentioned a word, you said Ooh. light plot. So I am going to stretch technology here. I'm going to share a plot you sent from Bohem. Cool. So I've got. Are you able to see that, everybody? Yeah. All right. So, like, you can step us through. Like, what I've got, I zoomed in a little bit on this, Steve, and then I also zoomed in on the on the the legend here, so we can see what the instruments are. But what's what's the broad view? What are we looking at? So we have a bird's eye view of the stage right now, looking downward, and we have pipes running left to right that have individual lights on them. Each one of those little symbols is a light. Uh, we have a couple different types on this plot. Each of the different types does a different thing as far as how it controls light, the size of the beam, and perhaps what type of texture or color you could get out of it. Um, From our perspective here, audience yeah. is here, yeah. stage is up here, orchestra pit is here, so act that. Right yeah, spot on. That is correct. Um, this plot is for the Ohio Theater. It's a... Um, it, they usually have a rep plot, and that's the majority of what we see here. Um, Rep is, you know, what they keep hung in the air to accommodate anyone who's coming in, tours and whatnot. Uh, we modified it slightly for this production. We have a few movers hanging over stage. Um, so if you, Scott, can you point to those guys? Those moving lights, they're smart fixtures, which allow us to move where the beam is to control what uh, type of texture it has to make it look like, you know, light coming through a window. And you can also control color with those fixtures. And it gave us a lot of versatility in what we did on stage. Mm -hmm. um, what else? We have, um, they're not well drafted, but on the sides of the stage, we had these things called booms, which are vertical positions with lights on them. And so, Scott, if you point to them, there are, there's four of them on either side. They allow us to get a really steep side light. And um, on those booms, there were LED fixtures, which gave us a huge breadth of color that we played with throughout the show. Nice. And what's, what's an LED? Like we, we hear a lot, I mean, folks tuning in at varying degrees of, of knowledge of lighting, but you have LED and you have conventional, like what, what is that? What's the difference? In, well, like, so conventional is um, uh, typically an incandescent lamp source. It's something like the old style, well, <laughs> relatively old style fixtures or uh, lamps you'd have in your house. You turn it on, it dims, um, and you put usually a single color in front of it, and that's what you get. You can sometimes put, um, depending on the type of fixture, uh, a texture, which is something we refer to as a gobo in it, um, to get, you know, different stipple patterns or, or a cool effects. But conventional fixtures typically remain one color, whereas an LED has multiple emitters or multiple um, actual individual LEDs of different colors and together they blend to give you millions of colors that you can control from one source, which 
I think is really cool. <laughs> Basically, when you're sitting at the light board and you want to change color, you know, instead of having to go to the fixture and replace a physical um, piece of gel, which is the colored material we put in front of it, you literally just said, tell the, the board what color you want it to be. Mm -hmm. That sounds like it would be um, very useful in an instance like this, where we have limited fixtures, limited positions. I, in, in, incredibly useful. And I mean, with a show like this, I mean, we're constantly tracking time of day, right? And so you go from, you know, night to day, um, morning and then conversely. And with color, you go from, you know, an entire cold world to, you know, warm and yellow and, and daylight. And these fixtures can do that all instead of having to hang two or three or four systems two or three or four different types of light or different lights with different colors in them. Now, a question for you. Now, looking at this, it may or may not be visible on the screens. I can only see mine. So I don't know, those of you watching along, you may or may not be able to see, but I have a line here and I, I know what this corresponds to. This mm. was a painting that was hung in the air. We have a line here. It's close to the pipe, but it's not the pipe. This was a wall that came down. And then immediately upstage of that, we had a scrim that we we're using as a projection surface. So in a moment, I'm going to show a picture of what that eventually looked like. But how, how does a lighting designer look at this ground plan? And maybe you get a section, which is, you know, imagine this, you're looking at, at, the, at the floor, they like pick it up and turn it to the side. So you get a cross view. But how do you, how do you look at it and say, here's where I want the lighting fixtures. Here's the angle that I want the mat. And how do you minimize like going up and down in the bucket or bounce focusing a bunch? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's the art. To me, that's like one of the coolest things about the art. Like if somebody said, all right, it's like baking. You know, I love to cook, but I don't bake well. And I feel like lighting design is made a little bit of like the baking of <laughs> that technical theater. I mean, it, so with but both this poem and um, another production we did, uh, what was it? The Rake's Progress. We had this similar thing with all these panels in all of this depth going up, you know, from downstage to upstage. And so in both of those productions, I kind of had to assign lights to alleyways. Um, basically, you know, an alley would run left and right across the stage. And um, depending on what scenery is, is in for each individual scene, um, I, I assign lights that are, are allowed to play in that scene. And so like everything on the first electric was um, focused to allow us to light downstage in the first scene, which was the painting and the wall Scott had just mentioned. Um, and so when we go to position those lights, I bring in that scenery and we, take into account the scenery and make sure light is not hitting it. Um, at least in this scenario, this um, scenario, meaning that all of our surfaces, all of our scenery were, you know, two, two dimensional white flat surfaces, which we projected on. Um, and in this case, you know, we want projections to pop. And so we want to make sure that light is off that scenery. In other circumstances, we might be, you know, completely illuminating that scenery and giving it the, the you know, atmosphere and treatment it needs. But because it was a projection heavy show, it, you know, we fly in the scenery that we need per, you know, per location and then focus around it. And so I'm going to, I'm going to show a shot of the, of act one, scene one in a moment here, but I, I think it's safe to say that I'm not sure if you're using anything on the second electric for this. You may have a little bit for some shadowing. The, move, the movers, yeah. Here forward. So here I'm going to jump to that. Cool. So you can see like, the, here, here it is. Like if you can imagine a line up here on this screen, that's kind of where your second electric is. Up directly overhead of them, give or take, is where that first electric is. And you had a set of booms on either side of the stage and a couple of fixtures, which is kind of yeah. us through from like a, design perspective what what, what we're seeing in this shot we so, talked about it last week with Brittany and, and and with matthew just about you know creating the the illusion of shadow and 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 sculpting with light so there's a little bit of context but you know looking forward to it. well there's a lot of reinforcement i i tried to do here right and so we have these huge windows that are you know our backdrop and um if you look on the ground you can see that there is light reflecting uh, you know as if it were coming through the windows so that is coming from our big moving lights that are on the second electric which are right above um 
that backdrop. And um, that is our key source for this scene. We also have, if you, on the far stage right side of that electric, um, another moving light that doesn't have that window pattern in it. And that's cutting across, yeah, from the painting right to uh, Mimi. And that's giving her that highlight on her face that she has. If you look at like, um, if you look at Rodolfo, he has all of this blue light, you know, engulfing him. And a lot of that is coming from our LED fixtures that are either on stage left or right. And I'm pretty sure that one side is a little bit warmer than the other to give us some, you know, contrast and to give us uh, a little bit of more visibility and read on his face. Mm -hmm. um, but I think though the the top light from the mover is giving us the window pattern the side light blues are the majority and that key light mover from stage right are the majority of what we're seeing here so yeah. top let's uh, light from stage left light from stage right and uh, high side coming in this way so for i mean for everybody watching like the idea here is to you know if this were re in reality the moon would be giving a light that would Come in this direction so the the you know steve knowing that and talking with Brittany, the projection designer and kind of having an idea of how all of these things map out would say great well that this light source will mimic light as it's coming from the moon so she's facing that way so she's lit here his back is lit this part of the chair is lit mm -hmm. but but not his face you know were he to turn around then he would be in that in that moonlight you know this this whole window structure is just a one-dimensional surface that uh, our projection designer Brittany has made look like it it comes forward to the audience so Steve's further enhanced that uh, that that feeling where we have you know the, the mullion shadows from the window panes here being reflected on the floor you know and this this is a cool detail too Steve that I, I love even in the theater where we just get a little bit you know it's like part of that yeah. painting happened to catch a little bit of that moonlight coming in I love that we sort of bend reality that it's like super directional this way, but in reality, you know, the moon would be casting directional light everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so it was a really nice use. So I'm going to, so based on this, we're not using any lighting sources currently downstage. So on the side that we can see of this site, right? Or this no. Site, everything is there. Now I'm going to jump forward. To, I'm going to show the plot again. Do it. And so we've got essentially everything here down was active and i'm going to show a shot of the window the okay the oh window. yeah well and before you do that yes the window what you're about to show if Can you look you at back? the no no on the plot though that mover that center and upstage up yeah so that's going to be the light that you're about to see in the photo that scott's going to show us yeah so on on the plan you know when matt and Brittany and steve and i were talking we knew that you know you're seeing Rodolfo and and Mimi down here on the stage. You know the, that panel is here, the doorway is here. They can come through. That chaise was over here. Here's that painting getting bathed by the light. So we knew that somewhere right about here, this this square represents one of the platform levels. So things were preset already up here, upstage for Act Two. But we knew if we snuck the actors in a specific spot. Steve could catch them with light here. And then if Brittany mapped out a section of this front projection, then we can see we can see them. So that that mover, that center movers here, it's coming down and hitting them. They play an angle that's looking up and to their left. You can't see him in this picture, but Rodolfo's standing just outside of this shot, looking down. So it looks like he's looking down to them, they're looking up to him. And we still have, you know, all the all the sculpting from the moon, but we have this cutaway here. So talk about why does how does that work, like from a lighting perspective, Steve? Well, so why can we, we have, see them now, but not before? So before we had opaqueness, where there was no light upstage of that scream whatsoever, and because we're front projecting, and because of how light plays that material becomes pretty opaque. You can't see through it. And then what happened in this moment, as Scott said, Brittany removed the light, the projection from the windows, the projection of the clouds. And I illuminated upstage and that allowed transmission of light through there and we can actually see the people through it. It's, it's basically playing with angle of light and where light is distributed to allow transmission to happen. 
in here. I'll just run a I'll run a brief clip so you can like you can see it. Those watching can see it in real time. You have it. You have it. <laughs> yeah, I got a, I got a little clip here. And so in this, in this, you can see like this, this gives away, like it reveals the, the magical curtain of Oz a little bit. It wasn't really visible in the in theater, but if you look really, really closely here, you can see there's a teeny bit of light bounce. So you see just, yeah, you can see a little bit of actors legs and things like that. But in, in theater in the moment, you couldn't, but it just kind of gives you a glimpse of how light plays and how that, how that's able to work. And this, this gives you sort of that, a fuller picture here of just you know, the kind of balance. Now, Steve, a question for you. When you're working, yeah. you, know, you probably deal with this all the time, but you know, we see a little bit of shadow here behind Rodolfo. We see a little bit of the chair. Most of this is from the projector. But That's how, great. how do you, as, a, as a lighting designer, when you have a surface such as this wall, which is right next to the actor and it's receiving projection, as well as this surface, you know, three feet upstage of it, it's receiving projection. How do you keep from just blowing out the projection, the projected surface? Like, what do you do? You sharp focus, and then <laughs> that's that's really it. You just you you have to just fly in that scenery. Make sure it's there for your focus, and make sure you're aware of where your light is going. Um, it, it's a matter of planning and making sure you have coverage with uh, while shuttering you know, minimizing light spill on everything. It's just awareness as you go, what lights you're going to use and what scene and making sure that they're just not on it. Um, as far as composition goes, you know, in this show, because of, you know, the front projector, there's no front light basically at all whatsoever. That's <laughs> the biggest way of not bouncing onto, you know, see onto projected scenery in this uh, setup in this fashion. Um, if there was front light or spotlights in this production, we, we would not, I don't think we would have been as successful as we were with the projections. Yeah. And you can see here, like here's an instance where the light inside and upstage of this doorway creates the illusion that there's a little bit of a hallway or a vestibule. The natural shadow that's coming from the projection creates this shadow here. We talked about this a little bit last week about how Brittany and Matt would work in tandem to adjust adjust the temperature, adjust the hue, adjust this so that, you know, this baseboard looked differently than this baseboard. This wall looked differently than this. So this is an instance where, Steve, I don't even, I can't remember. I think you had I, something special in there that popped from yeah. the sky when people entered. Like it would That's exactly them. it. Yeah. It was, and it was just, I, it was actually two lights specifically designed for that. One was darker than the other. And as far as color goes and shot from two different angles to pull, to allow us to see people entering and exit. So they didn't just exit into a void. And again, that had to be thinking like if you were looking up and down, if this is the scrim and this is the wall, that light had to be really tightly focused here. So yeah. It was low onto the wall or, or light up this, uh, this panel from behind. It, well, it should have boat wrap, so you could, if you lit it from behind, you could see right through. No, and so for that, that's like straight down, right on top of it, right between that scrim and that panel. Yeah, yeah. There's, I, you know, I mean, you could sort of get away with it being, you know, from a side coming in, but then you have to worry about bounce and and again mm -hmm. illuminating things. So that was just straight down. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is this. Oh, now here we jump. We jump to Act Two. So relative, I'm, let me skip back here to this, the lighting plot. So relative to where we were, we were looking at action just taking place here. Here's where that wall was. Now we've opened up all the way to here. So all the way to the cyclorama in the back. And each of these lines now represents where there's a panel hanging. So before we went from using 12 feet of the stage Matt, what did we get, like 20, 26? Was that our depth from the- uh, We ended up all the way from the apron all the way to the psych was about 32 feet. Okay. So, you know, we're going from 12 to 32, Steve, this gives you a lot, a lot more space to play, but let me get a slightly wider shot of this. There we go. So like talk about yeah. what, what kind of challenges and what you were able to do here because we have very different light temperatures and things happening here. Very, you mentioned lanes before, you know, so 
And so they're now in we're a lane, they're in a lane, they're in a lane. Everybody gets a lane. Oh, hold on one second. Sorry, I got a phone call. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, so we blow up all the way upstage. Um, all of our booms, those vertical hanging positions uh, are being used at this point. The idea is that there's this warm glow coming from all of these, you know, uh, stores that are that they're surrounded by, and that it's nighttime and there's, you know, blue coming from above representing that. And so with this, it's really a matter of filling the stage with that, you know, environment, while also trying to throw some highlight to give some selective focus to the, to the you know, our main characters. And so in this photo that we're looking at, we have a nice highlight on them and everyone else is sort of in the background in that environment, in that warm glow from those stores. Yeah. Yeah. And that gave you, that gave you the ability, like if we jump back one, mm -hmm. like if everybody kind of pays attention to how, how the crowd is lit versus how, uh, in terms of intensity and temperature, they're warmer and more intense here, because that's where we want the focus versus this, where every, you know, more people are more into this focus. You know, that, that, that lane of focus extended more up and down stage. And the difficult thing with this, I mean, the focusing, the, actually, the actual positioning of the lights was figuring out the balance of um, allowing our lights to be open enough to actually illuminate our, you know, actors, our singers, um, while still remaining off the panels. And so um, Brittany and I had a little, we, we, we do it often where we have to figure out where my intensity can lie in order for her her intensity to pop and for us to actually work together. And um, I think the boom, the, the focus of the booms wasn't, I don't know, wasn't difficult, but um, there was definitely a balancing act and queuing to get it to, to be where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, let me advance to the third act. So this is a lot going on in this shot. And so, you know, last week we talked about how the surface of the trees and the surface of the interior, you know, this is the exterior of a tavern and like, here's, here's the inside, but this is all one flat surface that Brittany manipulates perspective to look as if it, it goes up and in. Um, talked about how she and Matt worked in, in collaboration to darken, you know, darken as it goes up to look like there's perspective, but there's also a lot of detail here where you know, here's Josh, I think, who's closer downstage. So it looks like he's in a little bit more of that warm light. And then actors here are further upstage are in a little bit less. But just, you know, how do you how do you think about this type of composition and what creates this effect where we look like we're outside and we look like we're inside? even though there's only about 12 feet and no real physical structure that separates us. I mean, on, I love this scene and I love what we ended up getting to with this, but um, on my end, it was pretty simple, whereas it was purely color and, and a little a good amount of angle as well. So inside is, you know, light coming from above, rather warm. Um, I think there's a little bit of light coming that way and a little bit of light coming that way, so high sides, um, filling the tavern just to, get, uh, to, to make it warm. Um, there was extreme difficulty in isolating that because of how close everything was. Mm -hmm. And so um, getting him to read warm as he is right now was, was a challenge. But once we figured out what lights we had available and focused them, I mean, it was realistically that which gave us that effect. Then outside, we use our booms again, and those are in like a very uh, blue-green cool color, and we have a ton of top light cool coming in, and that gives us our outdoor uh, wintry vibe that's going on there. Mm -hmm. And so mostly color is what's doing this contrast between in and out. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, a little bit of angle play, whereas like, the inside is very top heavy, the outside is more side heavy, but the majority of what's going on is color. Right. And where, I mean, where we are as a company, you know, we don't have the dollars to say, all right, design team, we're going to set you up as ideally as possible. We're going to do these things and, and go and have fun. It's usually, all right, these are the two sticks to rub together we have, and mm -hmm. here's our roll of tie line, and here's our roll of duct tape. So we, we even knew approaching this um, from the design standpoint that light was going to factor in very heavily in how we uh, delineated space and set inside and outside and you know, isolation. For instance, we didn't, can't really see it in this shot. Let me advance one. Um, 
like the gate, the customs gate that's usually here, we didn't, we didn't have a physical gate. We knew that just wasn't something possible within what we could produce and what we had time to load in. So we, you know, Steve created an area here of a very different type of light so that when actors would come in from off stage, up stage, and left here, they were down a level and at a different quality of light. And then when they were through the gate, they were up a level. And it wasn't as warm as in the tavern, but it still created a separation for them. And we talked a lot about, you know, like the collaborative process here. And this was this was one of those scenes where even in in final dress, we were still able to, you know, manipulate the positions of people and like we we adjusted this this had an extra panel in it we made that adjustment and we were able to like try to massage the actors a little bit more upstage to make them feel part of the world and get some separation so there's a lot of you know in venue on the fly stuff that we got to play with too yeah um, anything else about this scene steve to unpack before we move forward i don't think so i mean it was a very I, once we arrived at it, it, it the composition from my end was rather simple i think it had like four cues within that entire scene yeah. oh, what's the for anybody watching what's a cue no it was i i loved it Ooh. i might have lost you for a second can you hear me i can hear you a little bit for for everybody like watching who doesn't know or tunes in later what is a cue you've mentioned that word what does that mean Did I lose you, Steve? No, are you asking me or yeah, are you asking? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. No, no, it's no like, worries. <laughs> I, I thought you were, anywho, a cue. Um, basically, it's a, the lights set at a, a certain look at different levels and um, we record those levels and that is the basis of a cue. We go from one moment where the lights look in, look one way to another moment where the lights look another way that's going from one cue to the next. Um, and do yeah. you, do you, how do you set that? Like what, what governs that? Like, is it just like, Hey, letting lights do this or how do you arrive? Kind of, uh, no, it, it, you sit, you're at a computer, a, a board, which is basically a computer with lots of pretty buttons on it. And, um, you set levels, each individual light, you tell it what, you know, per, what, brightness intensity you want it at if it's one of these smarter lights one of the leds or one of the movers you might set its brightness its color its um focus where it's pointing to it's any number of attributes um and then once they're all set once you have made the picture on stage to your desire you record it in the board and then it's this, it's stored there yeah. um so that when you're designing and you're specking out a plot you're thinking about things when you're choosing a fixture or an instrument type thinking about how bright is it how what type of a beam does it throw um does it change color in and of itself or do i have to put a physical gel in front of it to change what's the quality of light so you're thinking of several multi-layered things to say okay now i have to pass it through the final filter of the budget and mm -hmm. this is how many fixtures we can afford this is where we're going to put them and now this is how I'm going to manipulate them to sculpt and create and bring atmosphere and life to what we have. That's correct. Often, though, I, you know, it, uh, it sort of starts with budget, too, right? You know, understanding where we can go. And then that gives us a, a little factor that we can base everything off of as well. You know, yeah. um, it, you can go at it from both directions, honestly. Yeah. yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna jump here like major temperature change in terms of where we are. So this is cold and stark, and now we are very different here. So walk us through this. This is that same so, painting just projected onto differently. Yeah. Um, so this is this is Act Four, right? I believe, right? Yeah. So this is the beginning of the blood red sunset which isn't obviously blood red here, but the sun is in, is in golden hour and um, flooding the space. And the idea is that, you know, the sun's somewhere in the sky coming this way and is slowly moving down this way, getting redder and oranger as, as the opera completes. Um, I think this is earlier in the act, mm -hmm. beginning of the scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah almost, almost at the very top. Yeah. And so right now, uh, composition-wise, we are... Oh, we have top light from the movers. You can't re see them in this photo, but they're doing that same um, window pattern in a, in a yellow on the floor. And 
what it's doing actor wise is giving a little separation from the background. Um, and then we have side light from our booms from either side of the stage. And that's what is giving us that nice uh, light highlight from stage right and the warmer yellower highlight from stage left. Yeah, I'll advance. I think this gives us a little wider shot here. So this is yeah. you know, farther into the act where we are more yeah. red. And for everybody watching, you know, what, what really inspired this look and this feel and this whole progression of this sunset here is that, you know, earlier in, in this act, um, everybody has gone away to find help for Mimi who is dying of consumption and Rodolfo remains. And, you know, he says, oh, you still look beautiful beautiful just like the sunrise and Mimi says no you, you have your reference wrong I'm beautiful like the sunset because the sun of her life is setting and so they were you know the team was able to capture this whole progressive throughout the act Steve how long was the cue it just it sort of I, went throughout I, the whole act I feel like there I think it was two I think there was a 17 minute one and like a 20 minute one. it was long yeah and it and what that did was just you know the 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 computer that was controlling the lights you know, it, it wasn't just like, a, oh, here, we've dimmed the lights, but as it might happen over real time, you're not really able to perceive it, but you're subtly aware that the, the time is shifting, you know, it's, it's growing later. And then to mimic, just like it did in real life, like once it hits a certain level, then it really started to drop quickly. Um, so it was pretty powerful. Yeah, and within that, it basically, I was, you know, telling the board how that color, to take that color path, you know, and what colors it, the, LEDs needed to pass through in order to create that sunset look. Yeah. Nice. Anything else in particular about the production? I figured this we could highlight a lot of the different things that you do and um, you had, take some questions I, or anything. Do you, do you have a photo of the last moment by chance? Um, this might be, I might have it somewhere. Oh, okay. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it got much more orange and it, it, and, it did. It did. and it did. Yeah, the contrast was pretty extreme. Next, next time around, I'll find it. Thanks. All right, so this would bring us all back here. Um, any any questions from anybody watching or, or tuning in? See if I can access Facebook on this other window too to see what's going on. But anybody have any questions for Steve? Christopher, I can't believe you don't have any questions. <laughs> Um, obviously like it does depend on what show and venue and all that type of stuff. Um, but if you were to have like a generic setup, what does that kind of look like? For any venue? Um, oh my gosh. I like a generic lighting setup. Yeah. Yeah. Just like a generic lighting setup. Like what, what would you normally have? So, uh, what, what I've become really addicted to honestly is this one type of light that's called um an LED. it's a luster it's made by the company etc and they're um these fixtures that just throw some of the most amazing colors and so it seems like on most of the shows i've done in the past year or two i've had at least 12 of those in some sort of arrangement that allows me to you know flood the stage in color um uh, as far as like every setup that I've had, that's definitely a thing that's grown. Um, usually there's some type of side light boom position. Um, it, it really, really, really depends on the piece, you know, like a generic setup uh, for light it means that you're giving illumination. It's, you know, your first job as a lighting designer. So um, it depends on what type of illumination you need, you know? If it's is there a like, a, like a standing canvas, like prescribed, you need blah, blah, blah. I mean, but that's prescribed based on, you know, it, it depends. It's like lighting goes through fads as far as, you know, the style of design. And so what Scott was mentioning was this guy from, I think the forties, maybe um, Stanley McCandless who prescribed, you know, a light on either side of the performer, 45, degrees out from the center and 45 you know up above the audience and it gives this beautiful two-tone look that's somewhat representative of the natural environment uh, of lighting in the natural of like outside you know where you have sunlight from one side and environmental bounce from the other um, um steve she thinks change yeah <laughs> go ahead 
question for you from Facebook from Wendy Bruning. Thanks, Wendy. Um, how much time do you generally invest in creating your light story for an entire production? It totally depends on the production and how much time we have in advance. Um, I have spent a couple months, uh, like hours, you know, multiple working on the lighting store. Um, I've also gone into a theater with a plot that was, you know, pulled on my butt and and designed for, you know, the moment and then designed what we could given the time frame we had. Um, so, I mean, on the high end, if, if I had my druthers and I, you know, had the process I wanted on every show, I'd probably spend a good, you know, 20, 30 hours on that, on that before I even proceeded with everything else. Yeah. Uh, Stephanie or Christopher or Matt, anything to add or ask? Stephanie? <laughs> Manipulating oh, the buttons. I'm good. Oh, am I good? You're good. You're good. Okay. Um, thank you so much for this. It's really, you know, as somebody, as a musician who experiences, you know, all of the momentary aspects, it's something to see the visual, you know. Um, so I guess my question for you is because your art is so, it, it, it's such a collaborative process that um, whenever a change needs to be made to the production as a whole, it has like this ripple effect with all of the art. My question for you is because your art is so, it, it, it's such a collaborative process. Well, that's interesting. That um, whenever, oh wait, am I? Okay, we may have looped or something. We looped. Yeah, okay, we're good. Oh, okay. okay, so because it's such a collaborative process and then I didn't catch the rest. Sorry. It's okay. Oh, no, it was a technological thing, not you. Yeah, not you. <laughs> um, I mean, when one change happens in the production, it's kind of like that ripple thing where all of the arts have to make their own changes to, to allow the gestalt to change. Um, I, I was wondering like what the process is like, you know, who makes what decisions in terms of, um, you know, when does a scenic designer make a call versus a lighting designer versus, you know, the artistic director? I feel, I think it totally depends on the company. Um, but, you know, most of those, uh, it, it depends on the situation, it depends on the company and it depends on what is being changed. Um, you know, uh, throughout the, my design process and tech process, I will change minutia all day long, nonstop, without conferring with anyone, you know? But when it comes to say, oh, I want the sunset to set on the other side of the stage because of whatever, that's when I bring in Brittany and Matt and, and Scott. I'm like, hey, does this make any sense? <laughs> you know, and, and we bounce things around and we see what works best. Um, it just kind of depends on the scale of what's being changed or what needs to happen too. Yeah, yeah I would say that scenically, um, if you're changing in the space, something has probably gone horribly wrong. So, uh, <laughs> uh, the Although, decisions, scenic, changing things scenically, I mean, there are some things, some small things can happen, some small things can change, like the placement of the set, like if that needs to get adjusted, I think, which is something that we did do for Bohem, we had to adjust um, upstage, downstage where some of our platforms uh, landed. And we did make some adjustments on line sets, uh, maybe just a few days before of our hanging panels. But there was, um, yeah, go ahead, Steve. There was that one moment in Bohem I, that I, I think it was all four of us when we were trying, to, I don't remember what act it was, but when we had that huge panel that we took out, do you remember? Yeah, we had, we yeah, had so that, about yeah, that had to, that affected um, what was being projected on. So we decided to cut one of the panels. I think uh, in scene Act Three, I believe it yeah. was. To well, yeah, you will get large panel yeah. to remove that from the scene, um, which is a fairly easy change because we just didn't fly it in, right? So <laughs> those kinds of changes are are super easy, but. Um, if, if we're talking about larger changes, those um, tend to happen in the design process. And we hope that that it doesn't carry over once we get the, the show into the space. But there are times, like Steve's pointed out, where we're like, 
as designers, we're looking at the stage and going, oh no, that no, no. <laughs> and so we have to, we have to get rid of it. Make a better choice, do better. <laughs> and, and Stephanie, something that we have, I mean, it's, you know, we, we don't have the, the, the dollars to do like mega things, but one of the things that we do that's, I, I think makes the work really unique and special is that all the productions we produce in Cleveland with Cleveland Opera Theater are new productions, you know, so we're not renting in somebody's set that comes in and we do it again. You know, we, do, we don't even recycle our own productions. You know, we had done Bohem about four years prior to this, and this is completely reimagined, completely different setting. And I think having, having that, that's a luxury because a lot of times, you know, if I go to direct somewhere, it's on a set that might be beautiful and gorgeous and everything, but there are no conversations with designers. There are no, hey, I have this idea. What do you think about this? It's literally, okay, this is the set. This is how I'm going to make best use of it. And, you know, maybe you talk with the TD, the technical director there, and you can make some small alteration. But, you know, working with Steve and Matt and Brittany and just everybody there, it's, it's a lot of fun to just to be able to conceptualize and, you know, hash out ideas and just ha have the type of team that can take under a high stress environment of like producing live theater you know, to say like, hey, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? Or hey, Scott, what about this? Oh, yeah, okay. Hmm, yeah, let me try. I've been working on that. Let me actually, now's a good moment. Let me run up there and see if we can manipulate this one last time. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's a nice... The other, thing, the other thing that we don't have the luxury of is like seeing it put together before we see it, right? Oh, so yeah. we're, we're a company that, that loads this thing in for the first time and like, Fingers crossed, it, it comes out the way that we had imagined it before. So that adds a, another level of, of stress um, when it comes to considering um, what to let go of. Yeah, I think that that's a credit to everybody on the team. You know, just to be like, all right, we're gonna we're gonna do it, and if it's not right, you all know how to sort it out and figure <laughs> it out. And we've got like seventeen minutes to fix it. Let's go. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty real. Yeah um any any other questions from y'all here with us on zoom or anybody on facebook that has any any thoughts or questions or any any parting thoughts it is totally trippy to look to this other monitor because we're about seven seconds behind <laughs> so that's really fun yeah that's confusing <laughs> like singing the national anthem in a stadium you just can't listen uh -uh. <laughs> <laughs> all right um, yeah, I think I think we're good. Um, I think we've okay. left the lag here. It seems like we have any new things from Facebook. Um, Steve, any parting words of wisdom or thoughts? No, I think that this has been really fun, though. I'm really thankful we got to do this. Yeah, <laughs> it's my first quarantine Zoom meeting. Your first? Wow. <laughs> you are in the luxurious <laughs> environment, the big island of Hawaii. I mean, I don't think, I think I'm just like avoidant of technology right now. I'm just like, eh, I'll take a pause. <laughs> All right. We'll pull you back here. We're going to work through, you know, more uh, next week. Uh, I think Kesha is going to join us, talk about costume design. <gasps> oh, cool. And we're going to work through, we're going to talk to like critic, conductor, assistant conductor, children's chorus. Um, production manager, props, master, mistress, you know, all, all, all the elements, all the areas. And then we'll come back together again to chat about um, hopefully Carmen <laughs> and talk, you know, take all these things that we've kind of gone like department by department and then just have a little bit of like a round table about, Hey, here's what it's like. And then probably, I don't know if we're real brave, we can put like an actual design meeting up here that people can realistically <laughs> Drop that would be fun it. bring your lunch bring your, bring your lunch. <laughs> we'll have to rate that maybe maybe that'll get like a pg-13 no, nsfw <laughs> not safe for work uh, well thank you steve thank you, uh, thank you guys thanks, thanks christopher you're, you're like all, our stalwart uk following <laughs> man thanks for joining us stephanie thank that. You for hopping in here and thanks for everybody who uh tuned in on facebook live and uh we will see you next time all right. Take care, y'all. Bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye. -bye. Bye.